here to this happy occasion of the commencement exercises of Calvin College. As we begin, won't you join me in bowing your heads for a prayer? <laughs> Our Father God, how marvelously good you are. How worthy of our praise, how worthy of our thanks. With a covenant-keeping love, you have bound us to yourself through your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He has brought purpose and meaningful commitment into our lives. Through him, you have asked of us our hearts, and with obedient love we offer not only our hearts, but our lives in service. May this brief interlude as we find ourselves between a period of completion and a season of new beginnings be only one more of the many occasions when we acknowledge with great thanks the significant impact your Lordship has on our lives. We praise you for Calvin College. We're so grateful to you for her administrators and faculty and staff. And what a rich gift, precious and select are her students. With this service of commencement, we present them all to you. Bring glory to your name through their lives and their service. Amen. Let me invite you to be seated. <laughs> Dr. John Timmerman joined the Calvin faculty at about 12 years ago when he joined us from Grove City College in Grove City, Pennsylvania. He's a Grand Rapids native. He attended Grand Rapids Christian High School, Calvin College, and then went on to Ohio University where he earned the MA degree and the PhD degrees in 1971 and 1973, respectively. During the past decade at Calvin College, Professor Timmerman has established himself as a master teacher, an accomplished scholar, and a prolific writer. Some citations of his many contributions are listed in your program, and I encourage you to take note of them. It is not surprising that Professor Timmerman speaks with a strong and persuasive voice in support of Christian undergraduate higher education, particularly in the liberal arts. He invokes rigorous Christian perspective. He nurtures sensitive Christian attitudes. And he calls all who will listen to deliberate Christian action and stewardship. For this and much, much more, we are all indebted to him. In addition to his many demanding responsibilities in the profession, Professor Timmerman has always found time for Patricia, his wife, and their four children, who together with him have served the church and the school and the community in many, many ways. Class of 1989, I'm pleased and honored to present to you your teacher, mentor, Professor John Timmerman. Graduates of the class of 1989, including my nephews, Michael, Scott, and Troy. At this moment of achievement and promise, I want to speak to you on the gift of failure. And I do so in order to affirm that you individually are more important than the event that we celebrate today. Let me begin in New York City. This happened in 1968. My wife and I had just arrived in New York, bright-eyed and bushy-brained, and were living in a basement apartment in Brooklyn, a seedy apartment. But by living in that apartment, we managed to save enough money on the weekends to board the subway and go into Manhattan. And I've forgotten much about those Saturdays, indeed much about New York, save for one particular subway ride. It has been grinding through my memory in all the years since. Late one Saturday night, near Times Square, we boarded the wrong train. 
Now, that's not a very hard thing to do, and usually one can correct it at the next stop. But we were still new enough to New York that nearly all parts of the subway, the noise and the people and the hurry seemed pretty much the same. And it seemed that way this Saturday night until too late. Then, as the train rumbled through the dark night, this is not our neighborhood, we thought. This seemed like a scene out of an Elmore Leonard novel. Mean-looking streets, mean-looking people. We pressed faces to the dark windows and shivered. We wound up on an elevated dead-end track in the heart of Bedford-Stuyvesant on a Saturday night at 11 p.m. Only months earlier, much of that area had burned in some of the nation's worst riots of 1968. Litter lay everywhere, still clogging the sullen streets. We sat on that dead-ended train, looking at an unreal world outside, staring at the derelict hulks of burned buildings, staring at streets below, jammed with people roaming on a Saturday night. Go, train, I whispered. We like the tour, now get us out of here. So we sat, the only ones left on that empty train, trying like Alice in Wonderland to make ourselves very, very small. A man entered the car, sweeping the litter of a day in Manhattan from the car floor. He stared at us, bleary-eyed above his broom handle. When do we leave? I asked. He leaned on the broom. This train don't go nowhere, he said. It's here till morning. Oh. Now, he said, you got to get the train a block down from here. Out there? That's right. I think you can just catch it. Last train out tonight. I tell you, for the next block, we would have made Michael Jordan look like he had cement feet. <laughs> we really, truly did run. And there was the last train out tonight, but even then, running toward it, I was caught short by a message, spray painted on the side of that train. I really don't know why this one particular message arrested my attention. Obscure words to unknown parties were splattered all over the side of that train. There was a crush of noise and people at my back, but somehow I was stopped by this simple statement sprayed on the side of the train in psychedelic day glow orange paint. I hate, H-A-T, grills, G-R-I-L-S, I hate grills. And despite all the hurry, those words seared into my mind like a cautery. At first, you see, I wanted to collapse into my car seat and laugh. Yes, truly I did. I could picture him. Here was this young man whose girlfriend had jilted him. And he was so angry that he ran down here with his can of psychedelic day glow orange paint and told the whole world how he felt about it all. I hate grills. Poor fool, I thought. Poor frustrated young man can't even spell right. It is simply laughable and secure in the departing train. I started to laugh at this young man. Now, this reaction to me is not so unusual. And by profession, I am concerned about language, how it works and how it goes wrong. Like Prufrock in T.S. Eliot's poem, so often we find it impossible to say just what we mean. And it is not just the case that our government speaks of the war on drugs as high aggressive infringement action. It is a general insensitivity to language and meaning all around us. So the Calvary Baptist Church in Nagoni, Michigan, printed in its bulletin, after dinner the secret pails will reveal themselves. Another church advertised a used clothing sale like this. The ladies of the church have cast off clothing of every kind and may be seen in the church basement all day Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and perhaps you can imagine my surprise one Sunday morning when I opened the bulletin of the Tower Presbyterian Church in Grove City, Pennsylvania, and read, next Sunday being Easter, Mrs. Johnson will lay decorated eggs in the chancel. <laughs> Such linguistic fouls are always popping up in baseball, of course. It was Yogi Berra, none other, who said he never really liked Yankee Stadium because it gets late early out there. So too, this angry young man splashed a sign to the world that he hated grills and he simply illustrated the inability of his own language, the impossibility of saying just what he meant. I would file it away. The man is worth laughing at. Can you picture this young man just so? But even as I filed it away in my mind that night, slipping into the car seat and feeling the train jerk into motion, I had a second reaction. I paused in my mind and pictured the man a bit differently. Uh, by now, by the way, he had grown into a real person in my mind. Oh, I don't know what he looked like. The features tend to slide and refuse to take form in my imagination. Just one more face in the lonely crowd. But I did know him. I saw him suddenly as a very sad, a very lonely young man, perhaps the kind of young man who had been laughed at often, probably once too often. His loneliness, his rejection, his humiliation throbbed like a wound in his spirit. And the only place he could go with his pain was with his little can of day glow orange paint to the side of a subway and splash on it. How sadly, all by himself, I hate grills. And then a terrible thing happened. There on the train, pulling out of Bedford Stuyvesant for the first and last time in my life, and also to leave those noisy streets where somewhere there roamed this sad young man I began to feel one with him. I began to realize this disturbing, unnerving fact. We were, each of us, the young man and I, grills. Understand that when the young man sprayed on the train, I hate grills, he was really expressing a confused sense of abject failure that had been festering inside of him for a long time. He didn't feel like a girl. Everything neat and spelled perfectly in his life. He felt hated. He felt rejected. He felt like a grill and externalized it through the whooshy nozzle of a can of paint. A grill, a failure. I want to tell you what it is like to feel like a grill. You see, I understand perfectly how this young man felt. I want to confess to you that I too am a grill. Oh, I, I think I knew it already back in fifth or sixth grade. From my earliest years, you see, I had a clear goal in life. I wanted to be a baseball player. But all of a sudden, my body began playing tricks on me. First of all, my vision went haywire. I started seeing two or three balls coming at once. I had to decide which one to hit. And then, then this body started growing. It seemed at times at least an inch a night. I had no control over it. It was like a horror movie, Revenge of the Hormones. <laughs> and it grew big, knobby elbows and knees that were forever bumping into things. Long and skinny and uncoordinated it grew, this body. Not a ball player's body. Asked once about the potential of a young ball player, Casey Stengel said, he's 19 years old, and in 10 years he's got a pretty good chance of being 29. <laughs> At 19, I had a fair chance of being a college professor. People tell me that what counts in this world is power. In a world that thrives on power, 
I have learned that I am low voltage, barely a flicker. The only power lunches I have are at McDonald's, where orange sauce dribbles on my best unpowerful tie. My power trips are to Ottawa Beach. My power games are Scrabble and Rook. Just today I wished a powerful colleague good morning, and he told me he had other plans. <laughs> Being a grill, however, is something that happens inside of you. Perhaps it is a feeling captured on U2's Joshua Tree album. I want to run. I want to hide. I want to tear down the walls that hide me inside. I know failure. It is a shadow walking before me. I am one of those whose plans seldom work out right. I am one of those who is sometimes lonely frustrated. I often feel on the edge of the group, not at the heart of it, sometimes as if I'm not even there. I need someone to understand this, someone who will take me as I am, the crooked one, the less than perfect one, a grill, not a girl. It is impossible to say just what I mean. But I often wonder if there are any others like me. Indeed, there are many here who are the perfect people. The perfect people whose lives always spell perfection. Don't worry, they're being happy. The perfect people control the group and don't have to fear being left out of the group. They have power, not poor foolishness. They know the brave new words that leave us speechless. They can say impossibly mean things. Grills are the ones whose lives never quite seem to fit in the perfect picture. We are those who disqualify for quality of life. Our clothes, generic, name, brand, or no matter what brand, never fit just right over our behinds because we're too fat or too skinny, but certainly not just right. We come in many different shapes, all of them awkward. Mind you, we're not perfect like you girls, but we do have this in common. We are very lonely in that. Do you know that here at Calvin College, some of us were so lonely that we would go in the shower so that the noise of the water would drown out the noise of our crying. And all we wanted was someone to walk with us to the coffee shop. And so in my mind's eye, I see a second picture of a young man at the subway train. He is utterly, unbearably lonely. And with tears in his eyes, he wanders in the night to the train, takes his can of day glow orange, it probably doesn't work right, the nozzle clogs, and writes, I hate grills. And he is saying, really saying, why does everyone seem to hate me? Someone please love me, and I'll give you so much in return. Can you picture this young man so? But failure itself can be a gift when you do have the courage to give it to someone who will understand, who will take that terrible offering and say, that's all right. I love you just the way you are. You are precious in my sight. There is this third picture in my mind. This man was also rejected and he was lonely. He might, indeed, he might be called a grill. Grills are rejected by the group. This man, at the point of his greatest need ever, had his friends fall asleep on him. He seemed to fit in with none of the cool people of his day. He didn't dress like them. He looked very much like a scruffy wanderer. He hung around with all the very worst kind of people, like whores and lepers and geeks and nerds. 
And he said things that others laughed at rather than with. He offered his love and few, so very few it seemed, or it seems today, really cared. He was a man despised and rejected of men. There was none of the beauty that we should desire in him. A grill. Yet, in him, all things are possible. And in him, there is no meanness. I picture this third man now, walking in the midst of noise and confusion, all by himself because everyone has rejected him. Nobody wants anything to do with this odd one, this grill. He walks up a long and lonely hill to write something there across all the space of eternity that we can never forget. I want you to know, graduates, what he splashed across eternity for us to read. It wasn't in day glow orange, it was in deep red. It was written there for poor, foolish people whose dreams of perfection have dead-ended in the mean streets of reality. If you dare see him now, ask him. He's a grill, too. He knows full well the impossibility of the mean pain you feel. Ask him, how much do you love me? And see this man stretch out his arms across the crooked limbs of the tree and say to you, this much. See your name graven on those open palms with the cruel tooth of the nail. And let yourself be held from this day forth. Through all your moments of anticipation and promise, and through all your moments of awful failure by those hands. Can you picture this man? And may Jesus Lift up the light of his countenance upon you, and may he smile upon you, and may he give to you and to all those whom you love, and to all those whom nobody seems to love, his peace. Thank you. This 1989 commencement, Calvert College honors you, Dr. Robert J. Daverman, of the class of 1963 as a distinguished alumnus, for your outstanding achievements in the field of mathematics, for your pioneering work in geometric topology, specifically in the area of decomposition space theory, where your research center is known throughout the world, for your attention to the details of scientific investigation, making certain new discoveries are documented in understandable fashion for the benefit of the mathematics community and society. For your supportive and helpful ways with students, make it obvious your commitment to Jesus Christ in the classroom and laboratory. For your diligence in following God's call to minister to others in your church and community. And gratitude to God for what he has called you to do for the kingdom of Christ. We hereby present to you the Calvin Alumni Association Distinguished Alumni Award. Thank you. I'm very pleased and honored to be here in your midst to uh, accept this award. Thank you. At this 1989 commencement, Calvert College honors you, the Honorable Kenneth L. Rice Camp of the class of 1954 as a distinguished alumnus, for your outstanding achievements in the profession of law, for your leadership in the Presbyterian Church in America, guiding the denomination through turbulent times and in all the difficulties reflecting Christ's love and deep concern for your brothers and sisters in the Lord. 
for your inspired work for us as a trustee for Westminster Theological Seminary and other Christian institutions of higher education, for the high professional and ethical standards you have displayed as a United States District Judge, encountering desperate persons and difficult problems, and yet maintaining a firm assurance of God's control over his creation, for accepting numerous speaking engagements to openly profess your allegiance to Jesus Christ, encouraging your hearers to follow the Lord's example, regardless of profession or place, and gratitude to God for what he has called you to do for the kingdom of Christ, we hereby present to you the Calvin Alumni Association Distinguished Alumni Award. I'd like to uh, thank the Alumni Association for this award. I always felt it was honor enough just to be a graduate of this distinguished institution. I'm sure the graduates of today will realize that as the years go by. Thank you very much. Before our provost Van Harn presents the graduates, will the parents and the grandparents, the spouses, the children, and the relatives of the graduates please rise for a moment? Each Each year, Please remain standing. Uh, each year at this time, of course, we honor the graduates of Calvin College for their individual achievements. And they think, of course, that this is their day, and indeed, it is their day. However, it seems appropriate that we should also recognize the contributions that you have made. Today, the graduates experience the fulfillment of their hopes of the past few years. But it's also your day. Without your encouragement, your inspiration and your sacrifice, the young men and women here today could not have reached their goals. And so the faculty of Calvin College join with me in paying special tribute to you and in giving thanks for the goodness of God working through you. So let us all together today truly give thanks to God for his bountiful favor on all of us. You may be seated. Will the graduates please rise? <laughs> President Dikma, it is my great pleasure to present to you the graduates of the class of 1989. And now, graduates, 
by virtue of the authority committed to me by the Board of Trustees. I will confer upon you, graduates of 1989, in the order of the courses listed on the program, and as Dr. Van Harn presents you, the degree and certificate and special honors for which you have been recommended by the faculty, admitting to you all the rights, privileges, and obligations thereunto appertaining. You may be seated. It would be helpful if we would hold our applause until all of the groups have been introduced and have been addressed. Mr. President, I present to you the students who have completed the requirements for the Master of Arts in Christian Studies and the Master of Arts in Teaching Degrees. To you who have followed the pathway to become scholars and teachers, God gives clear direction when he says, Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Through faith we understand. Your pursuits are noble ones indeed. May your purposes always be clear and your experiences rich. And now, by virtue of the authority given to me by the Board of Trustees of Calvin College, I confer upon you the Master of Arts degree as recommended by the faculty. You may be seated. I present to you, President Dikema, the humanities majors who have earned the Bachelor of Arts degree. To you who have chosen the conceptual disciplines, the arts, the letters, and the humanities, as your area of special calling, St. Paul established a high ideal for you when he said, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. As you pursue your discipline, may you always strive toward that high goal. I now confer upon you the Bachelor of Arts degree for which the faculty has recommended you, admitting you to all the rights, privileges, and obligations appertaining thereunto. You may be seated. Mr. President, I present to you next the natural science, mathematics, and computer science majors who have earned the Bachelor of Arts or the Bachelor of Science degree. To you who have dedicated your intellectual pursuits to the better understanding of the sciences, God also gives much responsibility in a troubled world and in an endangered environment. The psalmist gives you special counsel when he says, The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. May you always weigh your responsibility prayerfully and exercise it prudently. And so now, by virtue of the authority committed to me by the Board of Trustees, I confer upon you the baccalaureate degree for which you have been recommended. You may be seated. President Dikema, I present to you the social science majors who have completed their baccalaureate degree programs. To you, uh, to you who will pursue the intricacies of man's relationship to man and to society, Jesus Christ gives wise counsel when he states, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. May the wisdom and servanthood of Christ guide you always. Exercising the authority given to me by the Board of Trustees, I confer upon you, as recommended by the faculty, the Bachelor of Arts degree. You may be seated.
Next, Mr. President, I present to you the candidates for the baccalaureate degree who have completed programs in elementary education. You who will teach small children have a noble and important calling indeed. For if you are to heed God's call to train a child in the way he should go, you will need to model that way by the way you live the Christian life each day. May God give you the grace and the strength to be faithful in that task. And by virtue of the authority given to me by the Board of Trustees of Calvin College, I confer upon you the baccalaureate degree and recommend you for the teacher certificate that you have earned. You may be seated. Mr. President, I present to you the candidates for the baccalaureate degree who have completed the program in secondary education. You who will teach in secondary education have no easy task ahead. You who would teach others at the most crucial age in student lives should be diligent in the prayer of the psalmist when he prays, teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. May God give you all a rich measure of his wisdom and of his patience. And by virtue of the authority given to me by the Board of Trustees of Calvin College, I confer upon you the baccalaureate degree and recommend the teacher certificate which you have earned. You may be seated. President Dekema, I present to you candidates for the baccalaureate degree who have completed programs in special education. To you who have dedicated your professional lives to teaching people with disabilities, remember always God's clear message to us all. We are all parts of Christ's body and it takes every one of us to make it complete. We belong to each other and each needs all the others. May your mission always be clear and your rewards considerable. And so by virtue of the authority given to me by the Board of Trustees of Calvin College, I confer upon you the baccalaureate degree and recommend the teacher certificate which you have earned. You may be seated. I present to you, President Dikma, those persons who have earned the Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. To you who have special gifts in the fine arts, may God fill you with the same spirit with which he filled the artists at the time of the preparation of the tabernacle. We read, the Lord has filled him with the spirit of God, with skill, ability, and knowledge to make artistic designs for work in gold and silver and bronze, to cut and sell stones, to work in wood and to engage in all kinds of artistic craftsmanship. As you use your many talents each day, may that spirit guide them toward the glory of God. And exercising the authority given to me by the Board of Trustees, I confer upon you as recommended by the faculty, the Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. You may be seated. I present to you, Mr. President, those persons who have completed requirements for the Bachelor of Science in Recreation degree. To you who will provide leadership in the recreation of body and the use of leisure time, may you always be guided by Paul's counsel to the people at Corinth when he says that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, so glorify God in your body. Although your rewards will not always be apparent, may you experience rich results on your labors. And by virtue of the authority committed to me by the Board of Trustees, I confer upon you the baccalaureate degree in recreation as recommended by the faculty. You may be seated. 
Mr. President, I present to you those who have earned the Bachelor of Science in Accountancy degree. To you who will have special responsibilities in serving those who must give account of their stewardship, Solomon gives sound counsel when he says, Honest scales and balances are from the Lord. All the weights in the bag are of his making. May God give you the strength to be faithful in your very special calling. And I now confer upon you the Bachelor of Science in Accountancy degree, for which the faculty has recommended you, admitting you to all the rights, privileges, and obligations appertaining thereunto. You may be seated. Mr. President, I present to you next the candidates for the Bachelor of Science in Engineering degree. To you whose work will be scrutinized by many and will affect the lives of even more, the Apostle Paul gives reassurance when he says, for we are all God's fellow workers. Each one should be careful how he builds for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. May you be given the special grace to walk worthy of the vocation to which you have been called. And by virtue of the authority given to me by the Board of Trustees of Calvin College, I confer upon you the Bachelor of Science in Engineering degree for which the faculty has recommended you. You may be seated. I present to you, President Dikema, those students who have completed requirements for the Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree. To you who will minister to the special needs of people at some of the most anxious and vulnerable moments in their lives, God has extended a high calling indeed and an extraordinary responsibility. As you strive to be faithful to that calling in the dedication of your professional lives to the care of the sick and to the infirm, remember always the assurance of Jesus Christ when he says, truly I say to you to the extent that you did it to one of these, even the least of them, you did it to me. And I now confer upon you the Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree for which the faculty has recommended you admitting you to all the rights and privileges and obligations appertaining thereunto. You may be seated. Mr. President, I present to you those students who have studied in professional programs on the combined curriculum, those who have earned a Bachelor of Science in Letters and Communications Disorders degree, those who have earned a Bachelor of Science in Letters and Engineering degree, and those who have completed the requirements for a three-year certificate in pre-professional programs of communications disorders and in engineering. To you who aspire to become professional in the helping and service professions, may God give you special strength and dedication to that end. With God's help, you will attain positions of great trust and responsibility. And thus Jesus Christ says especially to you, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. I confer upon you the certificate or degree for which you have been recommended, and also to those in absentia who have completed their combined curriculum programs. You may be seated. Please join me now in recognize, recognizing all of the graduates in all of the categories that we have just recognized.
now ask the faculty to arise. And I now ask the students to arise. And I now ask the parents and relatives of the graduates to arise. Let us now together read responsively as indicated the litany for commencement. The Lord be with you. <laughs> Lift up your hearts unto the Lord. O Lord, our God, creator of us all, and king of the universe, for your constant presence and for your tender care. You never turn your back to us, and you never ignore us. You have led us up until this moment, even as you led our antecedents, so that we, even as they, arrive at the destination you appoint, the goal that you design. You have gifted every one of us here present, parents, students, and siblings, administration, faculty, and staff, so that each and every one of us can be workers who are thoroughly furnished unto all good works. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Even when we are unfaithful people, you are faithful. You will not permit us to escape you, even when we attempt to reject you. You pursue us, you search us out, you find us, you draw us back to the road you wish us to walk, and you embrace us with loving arms. Today we celebrate your work in these young people, the Calvin College graduating class of 1989. Motivate these new graduates to leave no stone unturned as they seek to subject the entire universe and all its processes to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Arouse these new graduates to exercise their stewardship in areas of your creation which are so familiar and comfortable that further attempts to subject them to your lordship seem unwarranted or superfluous. Prod these new graduates to exercise their stewardship in areas of your handiwork which seem to defy all attempts to subject them to your lordship. Animate these new graduates with your breath, which is our life, O spirit breath of God. Blow them in the direction you wish them to bend, O spirit wind of God. As some enter the workforce of our society, as others move on to graduate education, and still others attend professional schools, we pray that these new graduates, as well as all of us, may seek to live in obedience to your call. We call upon you in the confidence of your benevolence to us, which is our surety in Jesus Christ our Lord, in the hope for tomorrow and forever, which is the promise of the gospel, in the joy you give to us as we live in your service, in the shalom you have inaugurated in the entire cosmos through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 